Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! It's looking like a good week here. Yeah? And we've had some announcements saying that... Why am I wearing this thing? Saying that we might soon be opening. Churches may be opening. We can go back to having dinner at a restaurant. That's right. It's looking good. Well, we're going to get straight into the show. We're not going to waste any time. So let me get straight into it because we've also got our guest online. I love it when I have guests that are punctual, on time. We're not chasing them up. Anyway, Shay Law is a true professional. So really, am I surprised that he's on time? But let me get into the introductions. Let's get that out of the way so that we can have a nice, good, long session with the one of the funniest men in Nigeria, if not in Africa. Mr. Shea Law is my man, or any day, any time. I just love him when he does stuff. Anyway, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Sholo Yubade, a.k.a. Mr. Mahogany. And you're welcome to Mahogany True Talk, which is a weekly interactive show brought to you by Mahogany Productions and Events. Just in case you don't know, Mahogany Productions and Events handles production and event management for clients. Um, the show that we have focuses on everything events, from hosting to music to food to like we have today, how to host a show. Um, we'll be bringing you the top guns. And this is one of the biggest guns in the industry that we have today. And um, to talk to you and give you an inner scoop of what the industry is really like. It's an interactive show, so please drop your comments. Please ask your questions so that um, we can um, bring them in and make sure that you get those things answered that you want answered. So let me now try and bring hmm, the one and only. Hmm, the In fact, I don't even have enough words to talk about this man. But let me... Hmm, the man himself. Hey, I'm excited. The man himself, Mr. <coughs> she, 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 law. Hey, that is him. <laughs> Live in fresh, in living color. <laughs> Look at him. Bro. This is a man, as you can see, the cheeks are rosy. They are big. You can see this is a man that is not experiencing any COVID-19. No top <laughs> ahead. Money is still over rolling. Can you see? See, even the laughter is rich. It, 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 you know when these are, you know when people are not hungry, they laugh from the stomach. Everything just comes from the stomach up and laughs. Can you see? Look, look, see the cheeks. So if I had cheeks like that, you know that ah, life is good. It is rosy. It, it's so good to be with you, sir. Shay, how are you? I'm, I'm doing great. I'm, I'm excited. I'm good. We can see you're doing great. Look, look at your cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that is looking for palliatives, you know where to go. Just go to him because the food is overflowing in his house. No, we are, we are, we have given palliative now. We don't want to start going about asking for palliative ourselves. So if you are coming, you have to come with a check. <laughs> You, eh? you don't want to share. Come and share. It cannot be chopping alone. It cannot be chopping alone. What is this? Ah, ah. So, you, so how, how have you been, before I get into your introduction and get into the show, just how have you been coping over these last few months? Uh, well, for, for me, it's been about um, trying to be innovative um, with uh, my, myself. Uh, most especially when it comes to doing online stuff. And um, uh, I did about um, two different kinds of an online program, Instagram live programs like this, uh, that involved um, uh, brands. And one mm -hmm. was um, tagged um, the, the Comedy Lottery with um, Babai Jabu, which I did for about a month uh, every week. And um, I did another one that was called um, Owambe, the Battle of the Bands. So this involved mm -hmm. different different brands, and um, um, you know I was able to make something out of out of out of it. So it wasn't just about me jumping into the live shows and uh, and other stuff. I had to do something that brings in a little bit of revenue to keep to stay mm -hmm. afloat during the period. And so, although we had other ideas that I did that involves, um, you know, just interacting with um, 
uh, the fans on the internet. Uh, one of such was um, uh, the one I did that I called Sheila on Instagram Live, where we okay. created topics that involves, um, you know, everyday issues, politics, and um, and so many other stuff. And then the particular one that I did that involves giving back to the people in my community, um, which I'm still doing every Saturday, is called um, uh, The Beautiful Songs of Ilaje, you know, with Shirilo. Mm -hmm. I'm an Ilaje boy. So I, I did that to, you know, uh, give back to the people back home. And good enough, we had people who came together through that program and we gave out them. Um, uh, relief materials to the people in my community. Well over eight communities, reaching out to over 300 people. Hmm. That's it. Well, it's always good to give back. I mean, a lot of people say that a lot of celebrities and, you know, people that have money are not being given back. So, I mean, we commend you for it. But let's get into the business. I mean, I see a lot of your people are here that you show key they're taller, they're all coming to join. They want to hear about you, so it's not about me. But as I always like to do, I like to do an introduction about my guests so that people have an idea of who you are. And then we're going to get into the business about talking about what it's like to the art of hosting. Because you're one of the yeah. best hosts there is in Nigeria, if not Africa. So we want to, we're going to, it's called Mahogany True Talk, Shay. So we don't want yeah. you to be doing, oh, well, I don't really want to say, you know, it's not good for, we want you to say it as it is, okay? So I, I think it is, it is very important when, when we talk about, um, when we talk about something to be very expressive about it. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed with the uh, um, young generation is the fact that there is a lot of talks about um, uh, motivational speakers who are not real, most especially mm -hmm. with Nigerians. And when you ask, how did you get here? It's all about, uh, it is God. <laughs> you know, so, so I believe, I believe uh, with the Mahogany Truth Talk, we'll be able to shed light on, uh, on the, the path that brought us here and, and how we're able to overcome some challenges together where, where we are today. Fantastic. That's what I hear. So let me do your introduction very quickly. Lawrence Oluwashe Tom. Ale Tile, please forgive my pronunciation. I, I beg, oh, no vex. Properly <laughs> known as Shei Law, is a comedian and host that has featured in many comedy shows and events, not just in Nigeria, but beyond the shores of Nigeria. A native of Ondo State. Me, I'm from Ondo Town. Oh. Anyway, so we are, we, are, we are neighbors. A native of Ondo State, Shei Law is known for his ability to make you laugh and give the guests at events that he hosts a thrilling experience. A veteran in the industry for way over 14 years, Shay Law has practiced and honed his craft, and this has helped him serve his audience better. With many awards to his name for his craft and humanitarian service, Shay Law is a favorite guest, uh, as is a favorite amongst guests at every event. Shay, you are welcome to Mahogany Truth Talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. All right, so let's get straight into it. I don't want to waste time because they only give us an hour on this thing. How did, how did you get started? So tell us how you started. How did you start hosting events? What got you into it? Um, the, the background story, it's, um, you know, like I always tell um, people, um, sometimes you, the part is not defined. To, to where you're going until mm -hmm. you're well into the journey. You know, it's like True. that headlamp of the car keeps, you know, in the, in the night, it keeps opening you to the road as, 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 you, as you move along. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to be in the entertainment industry um, as far back as 2003. Yes, 2003 precisely. I, I guess it was because um, I had gotten admission at one time uh, to study medicine in the medicine and surgery, uh, and then because um, my mom couldn't raise the uh, money needed, you know, I had to now forego that admission, and so um, I was looking for a way out. 
I've been mm-hmm. doing all sort of jobs. I remember at one point I was I was doing a job that was I was earning about five thousand naira monthly, and I had about um, five to six families dependent on that money. Wow! Know? And I remember my my uh, transportation uh, uh, monthly was about two thousand three hundred. So we had about two thousand seven hundred to feed about right. six of us then, you know. So I was looking for a way to make more money. And so I decided to uh, start um, going to uh, the National Art Theater, then to see if I could get a role in the, in the movie uh, industry. And then we used to go with our five by seven pictures. Then I had to move to O'Reilly to stay with uh, one of my uncles. You know, mm-hmm. so I was going, but then it wasn't it wasn't working out. You know, you go, you try to see if you get um, uh, that role. You know, you meet the actors by uh, uh, the tree. Then somewhere very close to the news agency center, there about. You know, I used to see the likes of the Sam mm-hmm. Loco, if a the just uh, just is a series, just as a series, they come around that place, and it was just like you hear somebody like uh, some local speak, and you're like, man, ah, this man can speak, and yet he's so funny. These were the people that you know when you see them, you know there is this aura around them that makes you want to improve on yourself. That even though you're funny, there should be this element about you that is able to speak very well, you know. Mm-hmm. But then I couldn't, I couldn't get a role, and so at one point I was running low on cash, and then I decided to merge up with my brother to start managing his uh, phone call business, which he eventually left for me at the relay bus stop. And so mm-hmm. sometimes I will leave the place, go to the National Theatre to see if I can still get a role. You know, mm. I couldn't get anyone. So one day, I had gone to the bus stop to do business as usual. And then I, I went home in the night. And I saw the movie Snow White and the Seven Dwarf. And so after the movie, I made a joke from the movie. And, you know, my cousin, everybody had a good laugh at home that day. And then my cousin, who was a member of a music group, a gospel music group, said, do you know that this thing that you're always do, making us laugh at home, people are making money from me. And that was how he told me, this was in 2005, and he told me, well, they're going for it. They're having a show um, in two weeks at a church somewhere. Um, it's called the Redeemed Christian Church of God, New Life Parish in Ikmori. And he mm-hmm. had invited me to come to that, to follow them to that uh, program. And so when they introduced them to come and perform, they asked me to go on stage, make people laugh for some few minutes, and then I will introduce them. And that was, that was it for me. I had never had any understanding of what it means to uh, do comedy professionally. I had mm-hmm. only been a member of the Cultural and Dramatic Club during my, primary, uh, my secondary school days. So it was more like just making my fellow student laugh. And so I just did it the way I would. And it was huge. The laughter was loud. And people loved it. After mm-hmm. that performance, somebody came to me and said, I would like you to come to our church to do this same thing for us in our church. We're having a youth program. And that was how it started. I went to that church, met a maker smith, and I started getting calls to be at different churches to to do comedy. That was that well, was just see, the story. <laughs> you see, one 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 of the beautiful things I love about this story that you're giving us here is that a lot of people will look at you now and say, "Ah, it's okay for you. You are successful. You have money. You have done well." But look at your roots. You started like the average Nigerian person has started. You were selling phone cards, a phone business on this on the other bus stop. You know, mm-hmm. most people look at you and not know that sort of thing, that that is how you start. So people that are out there thinking you cannot make it, anybody and everybody can make it if you put your mind to it. So you've been doing this for a while now, you know, 14 yes. years plus. 
what would you say are the traits or the attributes? What kind of qualities, what kind of skills do you need to have to be a good host? What should a good host have? Whether it's corporate events or they're doing um, social events, so like weddings or corporate or church events, what do they need? Because I'm sure you can't say one size fits all. Or are you telling me, maybe it does, that you, the same way you can be a comedian in church, you can do the same thing at corporate, or you can do the same thing at social. How does it work? Uh, first, I think one of the first things one needs to have as, as a good host is, is um, humility. And I say that with all, you know, um, respect to everybody in the craft because. So ex explain what do you mean by humility. Don't just yes. Leave the reason why I use the word humility is based on my own definition. I I tell people that humility um, gives you the opportunity or helps you to learn from those who are ahead of you, understand those who are within your bracket, and being humble enough to be able to understand the next generation coming that mm -hmm. means it helps you to subject yourself to learning that that is the reason why um transitioning from being able to perform in the church and make people laugh to being able to stay in front of a different audience entirely and make them laugh uh, is two different things and i had the opportunity to first uh, uh, be given the opportunity to perform in front of all the crowd aside from the church by um, Jedi, the comedian. And so the first event it took me to, I had to sit down and watch him do it. Mm -hmm. And that was a learning process. He's somebody who is ahead of me in the business. And now, one of the things that I saw that I grabbed was relating to your audience okay. matters. You need to understand that they are different audience. You know, you can, you have people who will celebrate you for the Yoruba that you speak. You have people who will just want to be able to relate with the program through your spoken English. You have people who will want to have maximum fun through your jokes, mm -hmm. and you have people who just want you to help them tailor their event. So these are different things. Your choice of words, whether spoken English or your native dialect, your jokes, your communication of the event. These are different things in different places. You know, you can be in a church and anything you say provided is now vulgar, goes. You can be funny in the church and not be funny outside because probably these church people are soft-hearted uh, soft and they accept you, uh, you know, with that love of, oh, yeah, he's just doing something, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you get to the corporate environment and you discover that this is a different ball, ball game entirely. They are not celebrating you. They are paying you to do an event. And if you're not doing it very well, somebody is probably coming and telling you, oh, God, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, like I, I, there was a time a younger colleague went somewhere and when he was introducing somebody, because of his um, times, you know, the tense he was using, using past tense in the sentence of uh, <laughs> something that is uh, present, continuous, and, you know, and then if you come... Why do you keep using pastors? Is this person is not dead? Hello? Can you just drop the microphone? We got somebody from our office to continue the event. And this wow. is something that some other people might not understand. Mm -hmm. So it is a different ball game entirely. But when you've had the opportunity to learn from, you know, like when I was working with AY, for example, we go to events and I see AY, you know, communicate the event. And sometimes I was feeling like, man, ah! Ah, man, I need him to introduce me here. I'm going to tear this event. You know, that's the word we use as comedians. Like, I'm going to tear the event. I'm going to, you know, make the people laugh. These people are going to have fun and other stuff. And then you discover that he would introduce you during that event. 
and I'm wondering, ah, this man should understand now. Nah. Ah, if he had introduced me here, I would have gotten new con uh, contacts here and all that. But the day I had an event, and I had to stand in front of the audience, and then I started the event, and the normal joke that I would have cracked that was making so much um, huge buzz that period, which was mm -hmm. my joke about the teacher who was um, stammering and was trying to pronounce crocodile. I, because of, I was intimidated by the audience, I started cracking that joke with pure English. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I was cracking the joke with pure English and I didn't get... Because I wasn't, pre I, di I didn't understand that particular state. I didn't get the kind of laughter that I would have wanted. People mm -hmm. only probably just chuckled at the joke, you know, like, and that was it. And then I could hear a woman in front who was a top dignitary saying, ah, can you imagine? Who is this? Why didn't they bring basket, man? Where's Sami Baba? <laughs> Look at who they brought, you know? And, you know, out of, you know, it was a sieve. I was empty on that stage. I almost fell on that stage. And then I decided to quickly introduce the next act. Mm -hmm. This was supposed to be a two days event. Mm -hmm. And my dependent of doing the second day event was on the success of that very day. Oh, the first thing, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I had to go backstage. And when I went backstage, I started talking to myself. And, you know, I had to pray, you know, like, God, if this is what you want me to do, I need you to take it over. Take over this job for me and all that. And then, you know, a different thought entirely entered into me that, you know, despite the fact that you are the one that has the money in the bank, you are not the one who tells the teller where to sign to give you back your money. The people who had employed the teller are the one who tell the teller what to do to give you back your money. So I said to myself, it means that all, this, all I owe these people is laughter and a good event. They shouldn't be the one to determine how I get them to laugh. The most mm -hmm. important thing is for me to obey my employers and make them laugh. And so when I came back on stage, I did all the first, you know, introductions with English language so that these people will understand that I can't speak. Yeah. And then I moved into my comfort zone, which is cracking my joke with probably ending with pidgin English, and then the ones that had to do with English, I put it in. And you know, by the time I had done some 10 minutes, and the people were laughing seriously, I, my confidence has grown, and mm -hmm. I wasn't even cracking a joke anymore, because now they have warmed themselves to me, and I've warmed mm -hmm. to them. Yeah. And so instead of just cracking joke, because of my first experience, I turned it into a joke. I said, Madam, but when I came out the first time, you were not laughing. People were laughing. I said, Who you, this white man? Huh? Oga, where are you from? You, no, 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 don't tell me. Answer me. Where are you from? And the man said, I'm from, I'm from uh, Lebanon or something. And I said, Leba a Lebanese. I'm talking to you, I'm not laughing. Where are you? How dare you know? And, I, you know? and people were really laughing. And that means that the audiences are never the same. That's right. You need to understand that it is a process. Sometimes you need to learn from those who are ahead of you to understand it. And going with the flow of how the industry has grown, being in the industry for years, I've also had the opportunity to have younger colleagues who have stayed with me and have seen the way they reason for their own time. And so when I go for some other event that involve probably secondary school student or the university student. It's another world entirely different from the corporate market. And I had to be able to blend the two together. What do what they want to hear in the university campus? How do I make them laugh in the university campus? Do I make captains of industry laugh that same way? No. So you need to understand the difference of, the, of your audience. The most important thing first is to connect with them. Once they're warm to you and you get that warmth and you build an energy on that warmth, the rest becomes easy. So when, so like now, imagine I, we've used you a number of times. Morgan has used you a number of times, particularly for our corporate events. 
yes? And we believe you're such an expert that we just say, this is the event. And maybe my producers might come and give you a little bit of brief if they say they want this or they want that. But generally, if you're called for an event, whether it's social, corporate, um, with the younger generation, what's your process? What, how do you prepare? What do you go through? So from the minute you are booked till when the mm -hmm. event happens, what's your process? What do you go through? Because I think people want to understand because some people believe that, oh, you just do. Sheila, he can just show up and start talking. <laughs> from my understanding of professionals and people in the comedy industry, it's not that easy. So what, mm -hmm. what's your process? I think first, the first process is to know the people who are engaging you for the event. What are they into? What are they doing? What is the event all about? Mm -hmm. Is it a sales event? You don't want to come and mm -hmm. do a sales event and start cracking barrier jokes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to come to a sales event and start cracking jokes about people who lost money because they couldn't do their sales properly. You know, you know, there is a way you want, you want to understand the people you're working for. First of all, you know mm -hmm. the company's profile. What are they into? What is the event they're having? Oh, it's their AGM. It's their end of year party. Now, then you want to know who are the people they are inviting. Is it their sales, distrib their, their distributors and other stuff? And then you want to understand the demography of their distributors. Is it uh, the uh, educated people or the semi-educated people or the people that will flow with um, English as much as uh, uh, possible? All these people, you have to look at, you know, you have to just understand the demography of the of the invitees. So um, mm -hmm. that is another one. And then one of the things that I always do, which I know that you probably noticed, is that I come early. Yes. And now when I come early and I see people coming into the event, I start looking at the, the people to study their mannerism. So when I understood about 50% of the audience see the way Oh, okay. This one is very jovial. Oh, this one is the calm kind of person. This one is this. Now I look for the jovial people. I look for where they are seated. First, I want to grab their attention, and okay. I want to spread the love to others. Mm -hmm. You know, which is very, very, very key, because one, you cannot have a hundred percent laughter. True. No matter how good you are, you cannot have 100% laughter. Somebody will still find fault. <laughs> so the most important thing is look for your people. And then have a good communication with those people. When you have that sweet communication with those people, when the other unsatisfied people are trying to talk, the ones that you build this relationship with are the ones that will say, ah, ah, but he's, ah, ah. What else you want him to do now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they become, they become like, um, um, like your, a supporter club for you. Yeah, like your fan base now. Yes. So you, you must understand that that is an aspect, and then um, you don't just take events and and just go to sleep. Sometimes when you have you've made your little research into the people, what they do, and all those stuff. And then when you start talking and you say something, he hits one of them like, ah, how did this boy know us? It automatically gives them this thing like, oh, he's a friend. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I was doing an event for um, Diamond Bank and it was their uh, corporate um, banking um, uh, uh, sector, which is for the major players, yes. CEOs of companies. It was during the transition of them um, uh, to the 2015 election. Then, you know, it was dependent on, okay, if this, um, uh, if there is a change in government, what are the things we are to expect? And 
if there is no change, these are what are, they're going to expect. And so for me, I started asking, what are the kind of people that, oh, we're going to have the CEO of these companies. We're going to have the CEO. So now when I was going to start that event, I had to introduce the CEOs of those companies and, you know, throw in a little bit of laughter at the end of it all. By the time I introduced mm -hmm. the first CEO, you know, and I said, uh, last on the list to introduce, please permit me to introduce to you um, Mr. Lawrence Oluwase Eto uh, He's the CEO. Uh, he's popularly called Sheila. And by the way, that is myself. And I'm the CEO of my family. <laughs> you know, that was me throwing in that laughter, trying mm -hmm. to put myself on the same table with them. Yes, I have a company that I run, but do I want to shove it in their face that I also own my own company? No. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to bring yourself down because people enjoy to laugh at your pain. Yes. True. And somebody must always be the butt of the joke. And so you don't want to make any of them the butt of the joke. These are corporate mm -hmm. people. So who best to be the butt of that joke than yourself? So it's about understanding the people and the environment that you're working in. Okay, so when we, when we look at shows, okay, you've worked with us, like I said before. I've seen some shows, uh, I've, I've worked with some hosts like yourself and others where they will say that they will go and do an event and they're the event planner. That they suddenly become directing this one, doing this one, doing that one. So when, while you're hosting an event, what's your observation about when you work with a show producer and when you don't work with a show producer, is it easier to host an event when you have a good show producer as opposed to when you don't have? Let us understand your experience because there's a lot of people on here that are event planners and a lot of them just feel that, ah, well, listen, I'm an event planner. The, the host, he can be the one that will be the event planner, the host, he will, he will do everything, he will organize them, will tell them to go for food, go and do this, go and do that, come and get the person from the backstage Come and tell this person that they're going on next. What's your view? What's your observation? How, what would you advise people to do? And how do you prefer to work? I, I, I tell people, sincerely, it is best to work with event producers. It is not good at all to be the person doing everything. It will weaken you at some point, whether you like it or not. It will mm -hmm. stress you out. It will stress you out. And it will impart on your performance. Yes, mm -hmm. if they want you to just be the host without the touch of comedy, mm -hmm. it is easy to come up and just introduce the show. But if you are going to add comedy to it, because... The reason why people prefer to have the host also being a comedian is because there are times that there will be gap in, be in between the show and somebody had to fill that gap. Okay. And that is where the comedian or the band or the DJ or the musician comes in. And mm -hmm. the musician can't do that job. He can't do it. it you, you know, he can't do it. He can't fill up all the moment. You know? Mm -hmm. And so if you, are, if you are the host and also a comedian, that means you're doing two jobs in one. Allow somebody to coordinate the event on your behalf. That is why for a long time, I discovered that when I go outside Nigeria to do events where people are just paying me to come and perform as a comedian, it goes uh, uh, more smoothly than it does when I'm the producer of my show in Nigeria, mm -hmm. you know, because you're overwhelmed with making sure that the hall is all right. You're overwhelmed with making sure that, oh, the acts that are performing got their room on time. Uh, mm -hmm. You're running from your room. And then by the time you get on stage, and some people will say, oh, he's the owner of the show, but he didn't live up to expectation. You know, this is something that has affected a lot of, comedians, most especially when you're doing their own live shows. So, so when you have comedians like that, that, say, why don't they use people like us? 
Is it that you guys don't want to spend the money? Is it that you don't understand our role? Because the whole idea of corporates will use us. Other people will use us. But when it comes to comedians, and I've noticed it, in the comedy sector, it's like you guys want to do everything yourself. What's, what's the rationale behind that? Yes. Well, one of the things uh, with that is the fact that um, I think uh, last year, one of the because you know you don't just know it all mm -hmm. i started understanding part of that stuff last year when i decided to put the production on this of the show on somebody and all i needed to do was to bring up the finances and other stuff and right. then in the process of doing that and i discovered that one of the ways that we can do is to get with event planners who have a relationship with top brands that can come into our events. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you see comedians want to do all the things by, the, by themselves is because of money. The finance. If you, don't, if you don't have sponsors and you don't have the necessary money on time, it becomes difficult to say, okay, I want to involve somebody where we get to share profit and other stuff. So the problem, you, you are thinking, what if I run at a loss and I'm already committed to paying these people? How do I go mm -hmm. about it? For some years when I was doing my event, I was running at, at, at I, I did about three major events that ended with serious uh, losses. You know, some up to the tune of 4.5 million, some up to 6 million at the end of the day. And I discovered that I pay all the other vendors and I'm the one who is at the losing well, end. The, the losing end, you understand? That's and then right. because of that, you know, when I eventually got uh, sponsors for about the last two shows, you know, I decided, man, I have to do this by myself oh, so that I can recoup as much money as possible. But when I did, you know, I got the sponsor and I did the first one and I discovered that, man, I didn't give my best. Mm -hmm. I didn't give my best. So the following year, I got not a major sponsor, you know, but mm -hmm. then I decided, no, let me allow somebody to manage the process. Right. And when the person managed the process, I came up and it was fresh. It was refreshing to me myself as a comedian. And I mm -hmm. discovered that this was something that Bobby, one of the very few comedians who allow people to package his event, fly time handles his event, enjoys. You know, he has that ample time to relax and just work mm -hmm. on coming to deliver the material. Mm -hmm. You know, but some of us, because we don't have, you know, the finances to go through with that process, and then we are thinking about the major profit we want to hit. Sometimes we hit it and we miss, and then we we'll go back to saying, okay, I will try it again. So when I did that last year, the plan for this year was for me to go around and talk to the major players in the event um, uh, uh, companies and tell them, see, if you can come, if you can help us get sponsors, you know, to come on to our show, we are going to allow you to uh, package the show and then we can talk about the profit sharing and all those stuff. So I think it is um, uh, time for somebody like me, having gone through that process, I cannot edu educate the younger ones that are coming that, man, you have to take the load of yourself and get mm -hmm. an event company to take over for you. And one of the things is that I discovered a brand uh, are more into musical concert than they do for comedy. Okay. How to change that narrative is another thing that we help the comedy industry because we do more shows than the people in the in the music business. Okay. And I so think why ask the question? Discussing so discussing with you will help us in that direction, sir. We're, we're getting there. We're definitely getting there. So why ask? What challenges have you faced in the industry? You know, to be real. What are, what are the challenges? Because there's a lot of young people here, and I've seen a lot of the young comedians that are here as well. I think they want to know what it's really like. 
uh, well, one of the major challenges that you get as an entertainer coming into the business is recognition. Recognition is a major challenge. Most especially comedy, you want people to be able to um, identify you and put a face to your jokes. Mm -hmm. You know, I see a lot of a lot of my jokes, some of my old materials flying around within the sector of the younger comedians. Everybody cracking an old Sheila joke. And then yeah. people think that, oh, Sheila, <laughs> where is Sheila? And then I'm in my mind thinking that this person that you people are clapping for, are shouting for, he just cracked <laughs> my own, all these are my old materials. These are my jokes that they heard from, from me, you know. I had been at an event where I sat down and somebody came, a young comedian came and he was cracking jokes. People were laughing. And then I called him after the show. I said, where did you get that material? He was like, ah, bros, it's my joke. Hey. <laughs> and I laughed. I said, do you know the year that I cracked this joke? <laughs> I cracked this joke in 2005. Because he just came across it, another person cracked it. You also heard it. You just think because you are cracking it and you're adding one or two things, it has become your joke. I said, my brother, you need to go and walk. Yeah. If people like right. us did that, we probably wouldn't have gotten a face in the industry today. We would have destroyed the industry before you people could even get into the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to work on our own materials, and that is why you have an industry to come into. You know, you see everybody doing skits today, and I can tell you, if I decided to trademark one of my um, content that is in almost... 90% of the skits that is done in Nigeria today. I can sit at home and everything that is posted on YouTube, I'll be getting a third of the revenue from all their views. Mm -hmm. If you are very familiar with um, Nigerian skits, you hear where this uh, scream that they always put when something happens, yeah, 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 yeah. That is actually my voice. Really? Listen to 90% of the skit they do in Nigeria today. You hear that voice in that skit. Yay! Yay! That is my voice. <laughs> if wow. I decide to, you know, trademark that and decide to pursue it with YouTube and yeah. all that platform. They will pay you. They will pay seriously, you. but if I had done that, the younger generation would not grow because they are Stepping into a field that they don't know. A lot of them don't even have that knowledge. A lot of them don't even know that that scream, that shout, is Sheila. And some of them who are doing the skit will walk past me. They can't even greet. <laughs> oh, they don't even respect the person that makes their skits funny. <laughs> Because sometimes you need just that shout to make that skit funny. Yeah. But, but what I'm just trying to say is that, you know, um, for some of the young people that are coming, we have made it easier for them to step into the industry. That's right. Because we gave them something to ride on. And what that means is that you can now get on a stage and perform as a comedian. And you say, thank you very much. My name is so, so person which is something that we built over the years to be able to allow people to um, uh, place our face with our jokes. So that when they go home and they are talking about that joke, they can easily remember, oh, the guy that cracked the joke said his name was mm -hmm. so, so person. And another thing that I also discovered was that in the comedy business as a den, when the young upcoming comedians come to perform, they perform at the early part of the show, which is good. You understand? And then, when the senior colleagues come, they overshadow the younger comedians. But that's how it always is now. This Beyonce is... this. Not, this Beyonce is not going to open for um, Tiwa Sabit. It's not going to happen now. You know? And so, what I started doing was that I discovered that in Nigerian comedy, it is not always like the special that they do abroad. 
you know we haven't grown to that stage you know and so because it's not like the special that they do abroad they still bring some senior colleagues to perform 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 before the main headliner and so what mm -hmm. i started doing was to get early to the event help the organizers to arrange the hall familiarize mm -hmm. and build a relationship with the organizers mm -hmm. before the show starts do all some of the dirty jobs that they're doing arranging chairs and other stuff and when i have done that when it's time for the shows to start i withdraw okay i withdraw i allow the younger comedians to go and then about two major acts to go I haven't seen the list and I just bust out from nowhere. Ah, bros, I'm so sorry. You see, I've been helping you to arrange chair. Yeah, this one. I just said, let me quickly go and change. Something just, I plead. And then they bring me in between the senior colleagues. <laughs> that you was self. my own strategy. You <laughs> you that was my <laughs> own strategy. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it can work for everybody. And one of the things that made it work for me was, the, was because I had the necessary materials to back myself up. Right. If I'd done it one, twice, and it failed, nobody will give you that opportunity again. And True. so I had made sure that, okay, I see this audience, and I know that my jokes will fly properly here. And then when I came into the industry again, one of the things that I also noticed was that a lot of the senior colleagues, when they crack joke, it was always talks about worry. Yeah, I, I never worry. understood that. What is with everything is worry. Is a, you know, I everybody talks that. about worry and all those stuff. And I told myself, if I come into the industry and everything I'm saying is for worry too, I will get lost in the mix of too many people. Other voices from worry will drown my own and so i said you need to change strategy and mm -hmm. what did i do i started infusing yoruba into my jokes and so when i left uh, or I performed somewhere and i left people start asking who is that boy that was talking that is always talking about yoruba people so in the midst of everybody they remember that boy that was yeah. always yeah, be yoruba yeah. people Mm -hmm. You know, so it was about creating a niche for myself. You know, and then to also make people understand that I can function in different parts. I'll come, I'll do my paparazzi with the English language, speak the English, throw in some pidgin English, and then I hit that punchline with the Yoruba, and then people go like, ah, this boy, he knows what he's doing. And that worked for me to give myself that face that I wanted in the industry. So it's about bringing something new, you know. Then I discover everybody now wants to crack joke with Yoruba. Everybody wants to do English. And so for some places I go, <laughs> you know, everybody wants to, you know. And so for some places when I go, I can be that same Sheila that speaks Yoruba. And I'll come and I'll crack the joke from the beginning of the event to the end of the event in pure English. And people will be like, wow, you speak so well. You do this well, you know? And that is me rebranding myself depending on the environment that I found myself. So you, you continuously, what I mean, I think what you're trying to tell the people that are listening is that you have to continuously rebrand. You cannot just stay static forever and ever because you just continuous and disappear. evolving continuous you have to continuously evolve as as an entertainer that is why for some people who are used to the old sherry law they find it difficult to embrace the new sherry law the same thing some people will tell you they said ah whiskey ah, the way it now seems is like he's singing for people abroad no it's evolving understanding yeah the terrain, and the class where he has found himself. That's you don't right. want to... Now, in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the entertainment sector, we have, you know, we have the Ote, we have the, the, the contemporary, and we have the, the local. Mm -hmm. You understand? And then, if you completely want to be Ote, you probably get the, 
the big gigs and and there are not so many players within that league right of the otty the kind of events that involve the otty you know and then there is the contemporary if you're a contemporary comedian and you are able to evolve you can function in the otty you can function in the local and you can also be a king and dominate the contemporary you mm -hmm. know, which is one of the things that I'm building for myself. So when you talk about the local, you are asking a Sheila to come to a day, to come to Kano, and the Sheila is functioning there. And then you are telling a Sheila to come to a Koyi, strictly sweet guests, you know, all the old band and other stuff, and the mm -hmm. Sheila is functioning there. And then you tell Sheila to be in the midst of uh, the Lagos Island the uh, lucky, the, you know, and then he can also function there. These are, you know, it's about keeping balance and knowing where you want to stand. Some people will tell you that they're strictly auto, you know, somebody like Bobby is probably strictly auto, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and he might not be able to go toe to toe with a Sheila in, uh, 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 the contemporary atmosphere where you need a lot of energy to, you know? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that his aspect where he's utter, he's not enjoying himself. It is about setting a standard for yourself and knowing how you want to function. I probably want to function in every league. Do you understand? But that doesn't mean that I will sell myself shape to be in the local league. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. But it just means that when you give me the right amount to come and help you, uh, you know, chair up the local league, I can be there to help you lift up the league. Like a JJ can function in the Premier League, but at the same time, yeah. if you take him to Saudi Arabia, he will That's also right. wow the audience. That's right. That's right. So, Shay, we don't have much time left. I mean, it's been an amazing show. What I always like to do when it gets very close to the end is that I like to now give you that open floor where you can just say some things. There's a lot of comedians here, by the way. A lot of your colleagues have joined mm. on here. There's also I've, I've people... seen Adele at so many of them. Yes. There's also a lot of people that are event planners, event organizers here. So, what would be your advice? What would you like to say to them? What tips would you like to give them? How would you just like to end? You know, just say whatever is on your mind. Um, like some of the young colleagues who, who are here would know that I'm never tired of, of advising them at every opportunity that I have. You know, probably one of my testimonies, one of my big testimonies in the industry is MC Ajele. And, you know, uh, he knows how I function. One of my key, my key uh, 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 principle is integrity. It goes a long way. It goes a long way when you're honest. It goes a very long way. Because one of the things that I told myself is that somebody contracts you for an event that is to come in another two months or three months. That is indirectly saying that you will be alive in another two months to be a part of his or our event. And that is huge. That in itself is praying for you. And so if somebody entrusts money to you for such a long time, the best and the only thing you own the person is to give the person the best of you and be honest enough to see that you do that event without sending another person to cover it for you just anyhow. You know, like some people would do, we take four to five events and then they start sending different people. I, 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 I can't remember double booking myself for events. I can't mm -hmm. remember. I work on the principle of integrity. And then for the young people, I tell them that the you in you is the real you. If they discover the you that is in you and you refine it, you make a unique you. And what I'm trying to say is that <laughs> when you look deep inside yourself, you know that you want to be a comedian. You have to take and go through the pain of redefining 
the, uh, the, 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 the process of becoming a good comedian and then become a better you at all times. And that is because I don't want you to start behaving or performing like another person because when you do something like another person, you become a second person to that person. They mm -hmm. say he performs like Two-Face. He cries yeah. jokes like I go die. He does this like Sheila. You become a second person and you can get lost in the midst of that. You have not made a uniqueness out of yourself. So I tell the younger person, you can leverage on other people's creativity, but don't dwell on it. Build your way to your own originality. Emeka Smith is actually here. Let me say a big shout out to him. One of the people that I met in the industry for the first time, and he accepted me without so much question. You know, and, and Emeka Smith and myself were able to, to also give platform to a lot of younger comedians. Mm -hmm. I, 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 can't, I can't name a lot of the successful comedians after our generation that are in the industry that never lived with both of us. I can't. Wow. You know, from... I'm not trying to, to bring down anybody's um, uh, uh, growth or where they are today because for you to even grow, no matter how much you are with somebody, uh, 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 you must have done something right to get yourself there. You know, it's mm -hmm. always a learning process. The likes of Funny Bone, uh, uh, Acapella, Prince Will, uh, Ajele, uh, Weymouth, um, name them. They pencil, they had all at one point lived with Emeka Smith and myself. And you know, that is us in our own uh, little way, reaching out to the next generation and building a pathway for other people to be in the industry. That is fantastic. By the way, Angel Gabriel from South Africa says hi. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, yes, they said, they said hi to you. Shay, this has been amazing. Listen, we could have gone on for another hour, two hours without any problem. I know from the comments I'm seeing a lot of people, there's a lot of respect for you. You know, you, know, you are very highly admired within the industry, your colleagues, um, people that are just do um, event planners and people that work with the industry. I want to thank you for coming on. I know you're a busy man. You said it as it is. A lot of people have learned a lot from you today, and I'm sure they'll go thank away. You, I'm sure they'll be hitting you up with DM. Everybody, please send your love with love hearts, thumbs up, smiles, waves. So please say thank you to Shay. We really appreciate him. We've worked with him a number of times, and he's always been so highly professional. And what he says about coming early is very true. He comes very early. He will sit down there for hours working with us, doing what he has to do to make sure that he has a fantastic show. I've never had a corporate client that has ever complained about him. He's a true professional. We appreciate you. We honor you. We thank you for the great job that we, you're doing. And may you continue to do all the great stuff that you're doing. Shay, take care and thank you. Um, it is now that this thing wants to start freezing. Anyway, I hope you heard. I'm now down to my last um, 55. Remove Shay. I think that was an absolutely amazing show that he did. I mean, he gave it to us as it is. It's Mahogany True Talk. We always love it. We'll be back again. Um, people like Official Angel said they learned a lot today. A lot of people are saying Shay, the boss. We will be back again next week on Mahogany True Talk with another great guest. Join us on Thursday as we have our special young creative show on Fashion Finance Africa. Guys, have a great week. Remember to stay safe, social distancing. COVID is real. We'll see you again next week. Good night, everyone. <laughs>